Okay, well, thank you, Ferran, and thank you to Pippa and the rest of the team for the invitation. It's really great to be here for this conference. This is joint with uh, Svetlana Chernik, Tom Ginsberg, and James Melton. Uh, Svetlana and James uh, were research assistants of mine back in 2004 when I started this project on constitutions with Tom. And uh, Pippa, you had mentioned feeling imprisoned by your data project up until 2016 or so. I feel imprisoned, but I also feel like I've imprisoned these two graduate students who are still working on it. They started in 2004, and they've become scholars in their own right, of course, but are still with the project. Um, my expertise is on constitutional design, the origins and effects of constitutions, and not on the management of elections per se. Um, so it's really a nice opportunity to, to apply uh, these data to that domain. My interest, um, or at least the background interest, has to do with helping out constitutional designers. My sense is that, for the most part, designers are doing things that they've never done before and will never do again. These are high stakes enterprises. Um, they really need a good set of uh, some information on options and consequences of these options. Um, so that's, in some ways, how we're approaching the paper. Um, Emily Bolio had mentioned to me that she, at the break, that she's doing a project on um, brawls within legislature. This is, I had told her I happened to have a photo of a brawl in the Constituent Assembly of Brazil, the 1908 Assembly. Um, and I think maybe the opposite of a brawl, a yawn during that assembly. This is from a wonderful set of photographs of the Brazilian Constitutional Assembly. But this is just to keep your mind on uh, who we're focused on in this paper. Uh, for the most part, you know, we're appealing to their reason. Well, of course, obviously, their uh, interests are motivated by passions and interests, of course, or in this case, lack of interest, using a different sense of it. The research questions in this paper. So uh, one is, the, the first is a very descriptive sense, just what has gone into constitutions historically um, with respect to election management, which uh, the conceptualization of which I'll talk about in a second. The second question has to do with uh, whether there's some consequences to constitutionalizing election management as opposed to uh, provisioning uh, it in ordinary law or some other uh, legal framework. So this question, in some ways, uh, uh, is a nice way to test some basic theory about whether constitutionalization matters. Because, of course, within the fabric of law, you have many options. As a lawmaker, you can put it in ordinary law. You can have a something close to a, uh, an executive decree, or you can put it in the Constitution. It makes sense to think a little bit about why you might constitutionalize something. There's some basic issues of accounting. You want to identify the organizational structure in a country. That's one. Uh, the second thing is the Constitution is obviously going to have large symbolic uh, uh, benefits. Uh, these are, you know, you write them in, as the country is just getting started, and you want to establish some unity and some attachment and some uh, uh, national identity. A third is, a, is what I'm going to call here solving dynamic and consistency problems, and this is just essentially making a commitment at a time where you're most sober uh, uh, so that at a later point, perhaps when you're not so sober, uh, you're less uh, likely to go against the public interest or at least your long-term interest, if you want to think of it that way. So, you know, obviously, in terms of constitutions, we think of this largely in the domain of rights. Uh, you know, uh, governments are always... Uh, seem incentivized to trample on rights later on, uh, but you could think of this in terms of fiscal governance, enacting uh, balanced budget agreements. There are all sorts of domains. To me, it's, it seems to make perfect sense to constitutionalize election management. Um, you don't really want a uh, sitting government at the control of the electoral bureaucracy um, for very obvious reasons, obvious to everybody here. Um, and uh, my co-author, Svetlana Chernik, has a lot of great evidence from the post-Soviet cases in which she finds that uh, incumbent governments actually are restructuring electoral management bodies uh, months or so before the election. So, uh, you know, great evidence of why you might want to con constitutionalize these things. So I'm going to appeal to the evidence from the Comparative Constitution Project, which I mentioned. It's something we've been doing for 10 years. We have a very ambitious goal of collecting every constitution ever written in the world since 1789, and this includes the microstates. I argued against putting countries like St. Lucia into the data set, um, mostly because these very small countries often have more words in their constitution than they have people. 
Um, but I was accused of being uh, biased against things that are small. So those microstates are even in the uh, data set. And our sample is about 684 systems. And I say systems. Uh, uh, we we differentiate between new constitutions and amendments to those new constitutions. Uh, that distinction doesn't matter too much. But you'll see analytically, sometimes I want to use as the unit of analysis the system and not necessarily um, the country year. Um, our sample. Uh, and this is not updated, but I just love the, the twist uh, that this had at the end when we adopted this to PDF. So, but anyway, you'll see the countries that are in existence as defined by Gledich and Ward, those countries that have some sort of nominal constitution, and those in the darker uh, uh, that are in our, our, our data set. Um, we have quite a few questions about these constitutions. And that is mostly because we have these historical questions about diffusion, and we want to get a very comprehensive sense of what's in the inventory of these constitutions so we can develop measures of similarity. So we've got lots of questions, some of which have to do with electoral management. Um, we have a system of, of interpretation. Of course, it's hard to, to read and interpret any constitution, much less historical ones. Um, and so uh, I could talk about reliability if anybody's interested. We've got a. Um, complicated and expensive uh, set of methods for doing that. Some all obvious conceptual challenges, the real issues between what is, um, in some sense, the large C constitution and the small C constitution, the small C constitution being the constitutional order that might include any really important statute or norms or that sort of thing. Obviously, there are issues between the text and the interpretation of that text. As I mentioned, issues about amendment versus new constitutions that may come into play. Uh, there are issues about de facto and de jure law and how, in fact, some of these constitutional provisions are complied with. Um, but I don't think any of that concerns us with this particular paper. There are issues of comparability that have to do, in some ways, whether our coders can read constitutions that are written um, a couple hundred years ago in far-flung places, but also issues of uh, uh, conceptual distinctions among countries and how they set up their constitutions. That I don't think concerns us here either, but I'm happy to go into it. We have a question on EMB, an acronym I'm just starting to really sort of become more and more familiar with since I'm not in the electoral management uh, literature per se. We do have a question, um, about 10 questions on electoral management bodies. Uh, this is the root question, just asked uh, whether uh, the Constitution provides for an electoral commission or an electoral court or both or neither. And of course, we turn to conceptualize electoral management into administration on the one hand and adjudication on the other hand. In the case of administration, we think of the provisioning of a special uh, independent commission as one thing, and that's sort of against what the bureaucracy would otherwise do. And with respect to adjudication, the question is whether there's a court, a special court, as opposed to the high court. OK, so, so there is this question about what's provided in constitutions. Traditionally, this has not been a core aspect of constitutions, although increasingly it is. This is the percentage of constitutions in our sample that have some EMB provided. Um, it's interesting to, to compare this to some other aspects of elections. One of the aspects, I think one of the benefits of our data set is to get a sense of what typically is in constitutions with respect to elections. You can think of these as the core items, um, or at least and with respect to parties, things that have become core, these are the percentage of constitutions that have these attributes. Uh, you can think of the peripheral items. Uh, campaign finance has never really been in constitutions historically, nor the scheduling of elections. Those sort of details are left for, for ordinary law. Um, but here's the electoral management policy. My sense is this is becoming a core uh, issue in constitution. Is, and if you're writing one now, you feel in some ways compelled to put it in there or some aspect of it. Um, there is the question of whether uh, to do a commission or an electoral court or both. And in, in terms of receives, we received wisdom. It seems to be the case that you want two separate bodies that are independent, at least in terms of the theory and administrative law. But very few have done that. Uh, both is the top area, and uh, the other two areas are, are one or the other. Um, is that me, Fetlin? OK, so it's interesting to actually read constitutions over time. And I've been subjected my coders to it, so I thought I would to you, too. Um, just very briefly, here's the Colombian constitution of a previous century. Um, it has a few provisions in terms of electoral court. But if you look at the 1991 revision of that, it goes into some detail. And I'm just going to pass by a few slides here. 
And you can see this is, in some ways, it's because of your flavor of what the typical constitution does right now. It's much more involved. So very quickly, the question is, do these have any, does it have any effect to actually constitutionalize electoral management bodies? You would think that it would, to the extent that it insulates, uh, in some ways, the decisions of these bodies from the, the political process. The question is to, to find some outcomes of these elections, and I've identified some, and the hope is that Pippa and team will actually provide us with some much better outcomes, just some bivariate associations. It turns out, among democratic elections, I don't know if you could read this very well, but uh, these outcomes are all, this is binary uh, uh, outcomes, whether it's fair, accepted, and of high quality, and there's not much variance at all among the democratic elections. You really have to go to the authoritarian elections. And um, you find that there is, uh, there are, with one of these measures, at least some differences. Um, and I'll just conclude that, uh, you know, this is what we're finding. It's constitutionalized for what, it, for in, in some ways, they're bucking some of the uh, received wisdom about how it should be constitutionalized. And we're seeing some effect. It's very mixed. And I wasn't able to show you too much of this. It's very mixed as far as what the effects are. Okay, let me conclude there.